This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 8. Coming up on Space Time, a new type of object discovered at the galactic center. NASA's test spacecraft discovers its first Tatooine-like circumbinary exoplanet, and evidence that the solar wind is slowing beyond Pluto. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered four bizarre-looking objects near the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The objects appear to be gas clouds, but they behave much more like stars. And it's not the first time these types of strange objects have been seen in the vicinity of the Sagittarius A star black hole. The first, known as G1, was discovered way back in 2005, followed by a second called G2 in 2012. The four newly discovered objects reported in the journal Nature have been labelled G3, 4, 5 and 6. Their discovery is based on 13 years' worth of data taken from the Keck Observatory of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. One of the study's authors, Randy Campbell from the Keck Observatory, says the very fact there are now several of these objects observed near the black hole means that they are, most likely, part of a common population. And that's enough to categorize them in their own class, officially designated G-objects. This new class of object looks compact most of the time, but then they get stretched out when their orbits bring them closest to the black hole. Their orbital periods around Sagittarius A star range from 100 to 1,000 Earth years. And while G1 and G2 have similar orbits, G3, 4, 5 and 6 all have very different orbits. The best study to these objects is G2, which the authors believe is most likely two stars that have been orbiting the black hole in tandem and have since merged into a single extremely large star cloaked in an unusually thick envelope of gas and dust. And at the time of closest approach, G2's gaseous envelope was torn apart. It went from being an innocuous object when it was far from the black hole to one extremely stretched out and distorted at closest approach and it then began to become more compacted again as it moved away from the black hole. Interestingly, while the gas from G2's outer shell got stretched dramatically, the dust inside the gas envelope didn't undergo a similar stretching, and that suggests that something, such as a hidden stellar object, must have been keeping it compact, enabling it to survive its encounter with the intense gravitational tidal forces of the black hole. And remember, Sagittarius A star is a supermassive black hole some 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun. And this story doesn't end there. In September 2019, the authors reported that the black hole was getting hungrier, and it's unclear exactly why. It seems the stretching of G2 back in 2014 appeared to pull off gas that may recently have been swallowed up by the black hole. The authors believe all six G objects were originally binary stars, that is, each being a system of two stars orbiting each other that merged because of the strong gravitational force of the black hole. The observations suggest that stellar mergers driven by black holes may actually be quite common on cosmic scales, and that's a discovery providing astronomers with new details both about the evolution of stars and of black holes. In fact, the way binary stars interact with each other and with a black hole seems to be very different from how single stars interact with other single stars and with black holes. Just more proof that the universe isn't just stranger than we imagine, but stranger than we can imagine. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, NASA's test spacecraft discovers a Tatooine-type circumbinary exoplanet And later in the science report, claims that drinking tea at least three times a week could help you live longer. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. NASA's test spacecraft has discovered its first circumbinary exoplanet. Located some 1,300 light years away in the constellation Picta, the new planet, called TOI 1338b, is about 6.9 times larger than the Earth and orbits its pair of host stars every 94 Earth days. As for the two stars in the system, well, they include a sun-like spectral-type G yellow dwarf star of about 1.2 solar masses 
and a small spectral type M red dwarf of about 0.325 solar masses, the pair orbiting each other every 14.6 Earth days. The discovery reported in the Astronomical Journal will allow scientists to develop a better understanding of the population of these planetary systems. Around a dozen Tatooine-like exoplanets, so named for the desert world in the Star Wars series which has two suns, have been found using NASA's planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope, which ended its primary mission in 2013. Kepler focused on a small section of the sky with an unblinking stare, looking for any regular dip in light coming from a star, indicating a possible planet transiting or passing in front of the star and blocking out some of its light. The Earth-orbiting test telescope, launched in 2018, will cover nearly the whole sky, enabling astronomers to make many more discoveries, hopefully including more circumbinary planetary systems. This report from NASA TV. NASA's test mission just discovered its first circumbinary planet, a world orbiting two stars instead of one. Named TOI 1338b, it's nearly the size of Saturn and orbits its stars every 95 days. The two stars orbit each other and consist of a small, cool M dwarf and one much like the Sun. Together, they form what is called an eclipsing binary, which means the stars regularly pass in front of each other from our point of view. Tess hunts for planets in these and other systems by looking for tiny, regular dips in starlight called transits. Tess saw TOI 1338b's transits of the large star, but spotting them in the data wasn't easy. A high school intern examined hundreds of eclipsing binaries to search for planetary transits, which can look similar to some of the eclipses. Ultimately, he uncovered transits caused by the planet. If you could orbit TOI 1338b, you'd have a front row seat to see its suns eclipse each other every 15 days. But the angle of the planet's orbit around the stars changes over time. After 2023, we won't see it pass in front of the stars for another eight years. TESS will observe hundreds of thousands of eclipsing binaries, so there may be other planets similar to TOI 1338b waiting to be discovered. Meanwhile, helping to boost the numbers, astronomers at San Diego State University have also found a circumbinary exoplanet, this one called KOI 3152b. It's located about 1,347 light years away and has about 3.9 times the mass of the Earth. It orbits its binary host stars every 175 Earth days on the hot inner edge of the system's habitable zone, a region around a star, or stars in this case, where temperatures would allow liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to pool on a planet's surface. However, that planet would have to be a terrestrial rocky world, and a report in the Astronomical Journal suggests KOI 3152b is a low-density gaseous planet not able to support life as we know it. Still, the finding does mark the latest discovery by the San Diego team using Kepler mission data. Their pioneering work not only established this new type of planet, but it also includes the discovery of the most interesting of the circumbinary planets, the Kepler-47 system, consisting of three planets orbiting two stars. Meanwhile, a new instrument designed to measure the masses of exoplanets has received its first light at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. NUID is a highly sensitive spectrograph designed to measure the Doppler shift of light coming from a star as it's influenced by the ever-so-slight gravitational pull of an orbiting planet. This radial velocity or wobble method measures the degree of gravitational pull in order to determine its mass. The more massive the planet, the stronger its gravitational pull and the faster the star wobbles. And of course, a small star is also more susceptible to a planet's gravitational pull than a larger one. Planets in our own solar system also cause our sun to wobble. Jupiter, with its immense gravity, causes our home star to move back and forth at roughly 13 metres per second, while the much smaller Earth causes a more sedate movement in the sun of only around 0.1 metres per second. The speed is proportional to both the orbiting planet's mass as well as the mass of the star and, of course, the distance between the two objects. The information will help astronomers better determine a planet's density and hence its likely composition. And that will help reveal whether it's a terrestrial rocky planet like the Earth, a water world, or a mostly gaseous planet like, say, Jupiter or Saturn, critical data for determining its potential habitability. When applied to many planets, NUID will provide a more comprehensive view of what types are the most common in the galaxy and how other planetary systems form. NUID, which by the way in the local Native American language means to see, 
is attached to the 3.5 metre wind telescope on Kitt Peak and appropriately it achieved first light by studying 51 Pegasi, which way back in 1995 became the first sun-like star around which was discovered an orbiting planet. In that case, it was a hot Jupiter, at the time a new type of planet never before seen. Until now, spectrographs have typically been able to measure speeds only as low as around a metre per second. But NUID belongs to a new generation of instruments, capable of achieving about three times finer precision. This means it has the potential to detect and study rocky planets around stars much smaller than the Sun. Scientists are hoping to eventually refine NUID to the point where it can detect planets as small as Earth orbiting around Sun-like stars in their habitable zone, where liquid water could potentially exist on the planet's surface. This report from NASA TV. We want to find Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars because that's our best chance of finding a world with life on it. Today's the day that truck carrying the new instrument has arrived. Over the next couple of days, we'll start integrating the whole system together. But the first step is to actually get here, and today the instrument got here. The instrument is a radial velocity spectrometer. It measures to very high accuracy the wobble of a star as a planet goes around it. We are trying to do this, the level of sensitivity more than anything that exists at the moment. We're really gunning for is one of the most precise measurements of a frequency in astronomy. And I'm hoping we can get down to the point where we're really, we're really probing the limits of the star and nothing else. The idea with NUID is really develop something that is so stable that you're purely dominated by stellar astrophysics. Not only will it detect planets and, and measure masses of known planets, but you can try for direct detection of planetary photons, so that you can try to disentangle the very small uh, reflected light signature from the planet itself. Instruments like NUID present the first capability for being able to do it. One of the things NASA wanted was an instrument that could actually help the community follow up test objects. I think it'll be a very valuable resource for confirming test planets. So test provides the one half, and NUID I think will do a wonderful job providing the masses for a lot of these confirmed planets. Another goal for NUID is to identify potential targets for JWST, because JWST will open the doors to characterizing these planets by actually looking for atmospheres and images. And so it's very important that you find the right ones to spend time with the telescope. And that report by NASA TV included NUID Principal Investigator Saraf Mahadasan from Penn State University, Wind Telescope Astronomer with the National Science Foundation Jadev Rajagopal, NUID Science and Instrument Team Member Sam Halverson from JPL, and R. Peter Roy from Caltech. You're listening to Space Time, still to come, evidence that the solar wind is slowing beyond Pluto, and later in the science report, how one of the world's largest fish has gone extinct due to overfishing and dam construction in China. All that and more still to come on Space Time. New measurements by NASA's New Horizons spacecraft have confirmed earlier data showing that the solar wind, the supersonic stream of charged particles emitted by the sun, slows down the further away it gets. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal are providing important new insights into some of the farthest reaches of space ever explored. Previously, only the 1970s vintage Pioneers 10 and 11 and Voyagers 1 and 2 spacecraft have explored the outer solar system and the furthest reaches of the heliosphere, the bubble of the sun's atmosphere which encompasses the entire solar system. But now New Horizons is doing the same thing using far more modern and advanced scientific instruments. The study's lead author, Heather Elliott from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says the sun's influence on the space environment extends well beyond the outer planets, and New Horizons is showing astronomers new aspects of how that environment changes with distance. New Horizons is collecting detailed daily measurements of the solar wind, which is composed primarily of ionized hydrogen, in other words protons, as well as free electrons, and alpha particles, which are basically helium nuclei. 
and also trace amounts of heavy ions and atomic nuclei, including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur and iron, ripped apart by the extreme million-degree temperatures of the Sun's outer atmosphere, the corona. The spacecraft's also collecting data on other key particles, known as interstellar pickup ions, in the outer heliosphere. These are created when neutral material from interstellar space enters the solar system and becomes ionized by light from the sun or by charge exchange interactions with solar wind ions. You see, as the solar wind moves further away from the sun, it encounters an increasing amount of material from interstellar space. Astronomers theorize that when interstellar materials ionize, the solar wind picks it up, slows down and heats up in response. And New Horizons has now detected and confirmed that effect. The authors compared the New Horizons solar wind measurements from 21 to 42 astronomical units to speeds measured at distances of just one astronomical unit, recorded by both the Advanced Composition Explorer, or ACE spacecraft, and by the Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory, or STEREO spacecraft. By the way, an astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is roughly 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. The authors found that at a distance of approximately 21 astronomical units, New Horizons seem to be detecting the slowing of the solar wind in response to picking up interstellar material. And when New Horizons travelled beyond Pluto, to between 33 and 42 astronomical units out from the Sun, the solar wind was measured at 6-7% slower than at a distance of one astronomical unit out from the Sun, confirming the effect. In addition to confirming the slowing of the solar wind at great distances, the change in the solar wind temperature and density could also provide a means to estimate when New Horizons will join the Voyager spacecraft on the other side of the termination shock, the boundary marking where the solar wind slows to less than the speed of sound as it approaches the interstellar medium, the space in our galaxy between the stars. Voyager 1 crossed this termination shock back in 2004 at a distance of 94 astronomical units, followed by Voyager 2 in 2007 at 84 astronomical units. Now, based on the current levels of solar activity and lower solar wind pressures, the termination shocks expected to have moved closer to the Sun since the Voyager crossings. Extrapolating current trends in the New Horizons measurements also indicates that the termination shock might be closer now than what it was when intersected by the Voyagers. Now, based on this data, at the earliest, New Horizons will reach the termination shock in the mid-2020s. Of course, we're now at solar minimum, so as the solar cycle's activity increases, the increase in pressure will likely cause the heliosphere to expand again. And this could push the termination shock back out to around the 84-94 to 94 astronomical unit range found by the Voyager spacecraft before New Horizons is time to reach it. Of course, New Horizons' journey through the outer heliosphere contrasts that of the Voyagers, as the current solar cycle is quite mild compared to the very active solar cycle the Voyagers experienced in the outer heliosphere. In addition to measuring the solar wind, New Horizons is also measuring the low fluxes of interstellar pickup ions with unprecedented time resolution and extensive spatial coverage. New Horizons is on course to become the first spacecraft to measure both the solar wind and interstellar pickup ions at the termination shock. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, China says it's likely to undertake at least 50 rocket launches this year. And later in the science report, new clues about the cause of autism. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China says it's likely to undertake around 50 rocket launches this year, dramatically upping the ante from the 34 launches it carried out in 2019. And with the new year still less than a month old, Beijing's already carried out its second rocket launch for 2020, carrying a new spy satellite into orbit. The Red Flag 1H9 was flown together with three smaller satellites aboard a Long March 2D rocket from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northern China's Jiangxi province. Red Flag 1H9 is an optical Earth observation satellite equipped with sub-millimeter resolution, super-wide coverage field, and high-speed data storage and transmission facilities. The other payloads on the flight included the Argentinian USAT 7 and 8 remote imaging microsatellites and the Tankwe 5 Internet of Things communications test satellite. Meanwhile, the private Chinese company Space Trek has launched its Tanju-1 commercial suborbital carrier rocket on a test flight from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. The mission tested the sounding rocket's flight maneuvering and fairing separation systems. 
The new launch is designed to carry small payloads for scientific experiments and meteorological observations. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that ice shelves in the eastern Antarctic Peninsula may have become predisposed to collapse thanks to hundreds of years of thinning. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, are based on ice core samples taken from the northeastern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. Scientists reconstructed how fast the glacier has been melting over the past 6,250 years. They found the ice shelves have been thinning at a faster and faster rate for around 300 years which may mean we can no longer prevent their collapse as climate change continues to drive further glacier melt. One of the world's largest fish has gone extinct due to overfishing and dam construction in China. The Chinese paddlefish, which could grow to 7 metres, lived in the muddy waters of the Yangtze River. A report in the journal Science of the Total Environment claims the freshwater giant survived for at least 200 million years, having witnessed the age of the dinosaur and the introduction of the first flowering plants. However, despite its long pedigree of survival, it simply could not survive the deadliest animal of all, Homo sapien. Scientists have discovered that when a key protein needed to generate new brain cells during prenatal and early childhood development is missing, Part of the brain goes haywire, causing an imbalance in its circuitry that can lead to symptoms characteristic of autism spectrum disorder. A report in the Journal of Neuroscience found that during brain development, there's a coordinated series of events that have to occur at the right time and place in order to establish the appropriate number of brain cells with the right connections. And a key protein, P75NTR, is needed to regulate that cell division. Although not a gene specifically linked to autism, it is part of a family of proteins needed for brain cells to develop, function and survive. So the exact timing and expression of this protein is critical. Scientists found that brains without the P75NTR protein had more neurons than should normally exist, causing problems in the cerebellum, the working unit of the brain that regulates movement and balance as well as cognitive functions, and is one of the key brain regions affected by autism. The iconic and colourful giant Australian bird, the cassowary, the second largest living bird after the ostrich, has been studied for hundreds of years. However, their solitary nature in the dense rainforests of northern Queensland, which they call home, has ensured that many fundamental aspects of these animals continues to elude scientists. Now, researchers at Flinders University have used 3D scanning techniques to examine the bird's throat structures involved with breathing, eating and vocalising, which are almost totally unknown. The images have allowed scientists to compare these structures with that of other closely related birds. The results, reported in the journal BMC Evolutionary Biology, shows that the cassowary has many similarities in the throat region with its closest relative, the Australian emu. No surprises there. However, what did surprise scientists were similarities in the anatomy between cassowaries and other primitive birds known as paleonaths, such as the extinct New Zealand moa and the living South American tinamou, which DNA shows are closely related. A new study claims drinking tea at least three times a week could help you live a longer, healthier life with a lower risk of heart disease and stroke. The study, reported in the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology, found that over a period of around seven years, regular tea drinkers had a 20% lower risk of incident heart disease and stroke, a 22% lower risk of fatal heart disease and stroke, and a 15% decreased risk of all-cause death. When they looked more closely at the type of tea, researchers found that drinking green tea was linked with the lower risks, but there was no link to reduced risk for drinkers of black tea. However, scientists say the study couldn't show that tea was the cause of the reduced risk, and the researchers freely admit there could be other lifestyle factors that could also explain this link. A former phone line astrologer has confessed all, saying many of her clients were stockbrokers, advertising executives and politicians dealing with issues whose outcomes couldn't be controlled. She says the jobs taught her that intelligence and education don't protect against superstition and that it's uncertainty which drives people into woo. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says she found millennials are into astrology big time, having grown up with Harry Potter, 
graduated into a precarious economy, making them ideal customers. The, the personal experience of, of a, a, a woman who, for various reasons, she was doing science, I think at university or something, and found she wasn't doing very well at science, so she had to find some work in the meantime, and she found work as an astrologer, you know, like an online telephone astrologer. People would phone up, and suddenly she found she was quite good at it. Now, of course, we have done major studies of the online psychic and uh, astrology industry, and uh, what it turns out was that uh, she realized she was given some basic information to rattle back to the people who phoned up. She found out that the range of problems uh, that people had were basically, I think, what's referred to as first world problems these days. Uh, I'm not happy. Will I get a better job? Blah, 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 that sort of thing. And she learned to feed back the information that basically they wanted to hear until she reached the stage where someone had phoned up and said they were cursed and they had been to a Catholic priest and the priest was not able to do anything for them. So he phoned up this astrologer, in quotes, and she also said she wasn't able to do anything and that perhaps because the Catholic priest was not able to solve it, there was no curse in the first place. And this person got very upset and was abusive to her and she then said, well, that's it. That's enough. She realises she was fibbing, she was making stuff up based on intuition, if you like, uh, although that's, that's a very loosely used term. Experience, put it down to that. She's heard these questions and, and uh, approaches so many times that she's got the responses down pat. And when she realises she was doing that, she said, OK, she packed it in. And uh, I think she went into journalism. <laughs> in well, there's not much difference between the two. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Speaking as a journalist. <laughs> And speaking as a journalist myself, thank you very much. Um, the technique is common, in the, especially in the psychic world, that basically, and we've had people do it, we've had people get a recommendation from a psychic, go along to one of these phone psychic services and says, hey, here I am, I've got my reference, can I be a phone psychic? They say, yeah, here's your script. And basically, they, the idea is because these phone calls are charged at a higher rate, the idea is to keep the, the customer online as long as possible, or on the phone as long as possible. Some psychics are responding by saying, we've got a, a flat rate you can use, but it's pretty expensive. And and uh, it goes on like this. It is uh, a con, funny enough, that you're not actually getting sort of uh, individual responses by and large. You're getting a script or you're getting just a, a hackneyed response to the same old question. Well, what else could you be getting? I mean, that's a load of hokum. It's a load of hokum, which is worth a lot of money. We had a case uh, a few years ago of someone who'd spent uh, $92,000 of phone bills. I'm talking to various psychics and things. The trouble is he was doing it from work. <laughs> in America, there was a, uh, a group who was sort of masquerading under the uh, guise of a supposed Jamaican woman who was born in Los Angeles and didn't have any Jamaican blood. And they had made, over a period of a few years, $1 billion US. And when so you, the, and, you uh, and I are in the wrong business. Absolutely. I, <laughs> you t- <laughs> Instead of there are a lot skeptics. of areas where skeptics could make a lot of money. Our friends, the magicians, say the same thing. But then, yeah, a billion dollars, and then they had to forgive a further five hundred million in money they were owed when they were found out by the authorities, and they were fined five million. And so people look at that and think, "Yep, I could I could make a lot of money out of this." And there is a lot of money out there. The psychic industry in the U.S. is estimated to be worth two billion a year. Now, the the astrologer in our story here, she uh, she, she believed that uh, Harry Potter may be partly to blame for all this. <laughs> yeah, she talks about millennials. Yes. Uh, who are sort of, uh, as she says, they're facing a rough future. They don't know what the job situation is going to be. They're certainly a bit concerned about their ability to, to get accommodation, to get uh, a decent price of, for a house they want to buy. And they are looking for help. And they're not turning to religion so much or formal religion. They're going to New Age religions, and that might include astrology and psychic advice and health gurus and all sorts of uh, people like that. Um, Why and, Harry Potter? The Guardian Leviosa. <laughs> That's the age of the people. The, the, uh, the people who are reading Harry Potter when it first came out are now millennials, and they're now looking for something more meaningful even than Harry Potter. Hermione doesn't do it anymore. It's and they have to turn to else. Yeah, when, when they grow up, they turn to psychics. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStewartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to SpaceTimeWithStewartGary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. 
You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 